You're live, Madam Chair. Okay, welcome, folks. This is House Corrections and Institutions Committee. We are back. It is Thursday morning, April 13th, and we have with us uh, Representative Brian Chino, who's going to give us, to begin with, uh, a brief summary. Then we have some folks who are going to come up and testify uh, after this. But uh, Brian is going to give us a brief overview of H. Let me get the two bills, 38. Uh, 438 and 445 in terms of how those two pieces of legislation that he's introduced is interconnected, but then leads the foundation for the folks who are here to testify um, to uh, continue possibly with the slideshow or continue with how the two bills are interrelated. Does that make sense? Yes, and I'm going to set a timer for myself here so I can monitor <laughs> so you don't have to interrupt me. Right. Brian and I, and, and I was going to mm -hmm. say Troy, Troy, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. we made a deal. Reset, reset and we said Brian will have five minutes. Mm -hmm. and, um, it's a like public comment. You know? <laughs> so we made a deal. And so Brian worked through and is doing a slideshow. And uh, we'll turn it over to you. And, and if you could if you could introduce yourself. Yeah. For the record, so this is Brian, Representative Brian Sheena from the Vermont General Assembly for the record. And I'm here today to do a bill introduction um, of the twin bills, H-445 and H-438, and then um, hold space for others to share their perspectives um, on the issue of it, from incarceration to community care, which is the underlying um, point we're trying to make with these two bills. As some of you know, oh, let me start with some, as some of you know, that um, over the last seven years I've been in the legislature, I've been advocating for corrections reform, um, especially for the Norway model. And um, this past year, I was approached by, the, by Jaina from the National Council um, or from the Free Her Vermont campaign and who asked if I would work with them on a moratorium. And I said, I'm interested, but only if we also work together on the alternative that we can't just say no, we have to say no and here, let's do this. And so then I met with the National Council and they said to me that, that they, they couldn't get behind the Norway model because incarceration itself was so harmful and they challenged me to look at alternatives to incarceration and I will be forever grateful for that because it opened my eyes to the truth about incarceration and has led us to a proposal that I think is a viable way to start the discussion about how to eliminate or at least reduce incarceration. And so thank you for reaching out and working with me. And so here we go. So H-445, an act relating to education and corrections infrastructure. This is a high level summary. It would lift the moratorium on state aid for school construction and place a five year ban on prison construction. Um, I'm not gonna read you the details of the findings, but there's findings um, and I sent you the sources in advance if you had a chance to read them. And if not, you can always read them later or as you consider, consider these decisions you're making about corrections. But these findings are backed by a lot of research. Um, and our intent was to invest in a physical and social environment that reduces harm, promotes recovery, and builds resilience by stopping construction of prisons and by aiding construction of schools. And ultimately, the purpose can be summarized in the sentence at the bottom that we want to, we want to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. We want to invest in education and make time to explore to alternatives to incarceration. And that's why we want a moratorium for a few years while we do that work. And we and thank you to the body for moving forward with school construction. That it looks like the house at least has decided that we're going to um, start addressing those infrastructure issues um, around the school environments. So H four thirty eight, I went through with you once before. This is a high level um, review in which I just want to point out that in the findings there's language or that the economic and social costs of incarceration are far greater than any benefits that we can reduce criminal behavior by investing in social determinants surrounding housing, education, workforce, healthcare, nutrition and substance use and other mental health disorders, that we can reduce the social harm and trauma experienced by the Department of Corrections workforce by creating new job opportunities and connecting correctional employees to existing careers, providing community-based services, especially when we have record level vacancies in those services right now. This is a perfect chance for us to realign what we're doing. Um, and then, um, we give examples of the corrections reform in Norway and alternatives to our incarceration in New York City to show that they reduced recidivism. However, the only measure of success should not be reduction of recidivism. It should be the promotion of health. And so what we would like for you to do is to consider integrate. Oh, wait, I forgot my purpose here. Sorry. Um, so the purpose of our, of our act, I just wanted to highlight this piece that we want the, the creation of a community based system of care and re rehabilitation 
that reduces the recidivism and promotes recovery. And we would do this by having accessible, equitable, and localized services throughout the state, every community, every county, everywhere we should be thinking about over time. And we want secure and comprehensive housing. We want stronger treatment, educational workforce training options incorporated into localized and equitable residential programs, pathways to economic security, and nurturing of healthy relationships that repair the harm caused by people's actions and, and keep people connected with family and community supports. And this also speaks to the culture between the staff and, and, and people living in facilities or living or, or people who are justice involved, wherever they be living, because um, that's a fundamental piece of the Norway model was this re-imagination of the relationship. Um, so that being said, we want you, in my final minute, we want you to incorporate elements of these two bills into any and all legislative action on the replacement of women's facility and justice reinvested initiative in Vermont. And I summarize these changes, but I'm gonna provide you with an amendment to, um, as an example, so you have language to look at. Um, we want to integrate social determinants of health, including at least housing, healthcare, nutrition, food security, education, economic opportunity, social opportunity, violence, and structural conflict. We wanna empower people with lived experience by including justice-involved individuals, correctional staff, and advocates in the justice-involved women's working group and in the Justice Reinvestment Advisory Council. We want to explore alternatives to incarceration and reinvest in community-based services and housing. We wanna align the timeline for construction of any replacement women's facilities with the sunset and a moratorium, securing time for an equitable process um, of deliberation that thoroughly explores alternatives to incarceration before building new infrastructure. I'm close to the end anyway. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, so just, I'm going to back up that we want, because this is important. When we, when we ask for a moratorium, it's to buy some time to provide some relief to people that there's not going to be in the, sh if there's not going to be shovel in the ground for three to five years, then why not have a moratorium until that point that we can align that with the, with any construction of the replacement um, and dedicate time to really exploring the alternatives. We wanna reduce the harm of incarceration by addressing violence. This is very important because the current system is, perpetuates violence. And th whether it be self-directed, interpersonal or perpetuated by agents of the state, by the workers who we are mandating use violence to carry out the policies of the state. Um, and then we wanna reduce the harm of structural conflict and promote equity by using a lens of transformative justice, employing restorative justice principles and trauma-informed approaches in all group and organizational processes. So what does this look like? I will send you, I'm gonna send you um, a proposed amendment after you hear from others, so it's not a distraction because we wanna make sure we're holding space for people with lived experience and for my partners. Um, but I appreciate you letting me set the stage for, for that discussion. And at the end, I'll provide you with some language. And if you wanna talk about it with us, we can figure that out or you can talk through it with Ledge Council. And I would encourage you to hear from all stakeholders on that language as you move forward with your decisions to replace the women's facilities and to move forward with Justice Reinvestment Initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Brian. Oh, and then last but not least, it has the findings in it, but you've seen those already. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you, we, we appreciate it. So I'm not sure who to start with. I will leave it to you folks. I don't know who should start and what the, Sequence should do. Is it Tiffany? Is that what I heard? Yeah. Okay. Yes, thank you. Why don't you come on up to the hot seat? Okay. It's probably hot up right side. So Tiffany Hampton is a concerned citizen. And a chair? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. No, that's fine. That's fine. Take your time. Take your time. Uh, yeah, I know. I just print it out so you guys have it. Okay. So if you could, before you start, if you could just identify yourself for the record. Yes, my name is Tiffany <coughs> Harrington, um, and I live in Burlington, Vermont. Um, and I'm just actually going to get right into it because yeah. I think I'll explain why I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm here today as a directly impacted, formerly incarcerated person of the Vermont Correction System. My name is Tiffany Harrington, and I was under supervision of DOC for 15 years for my first and only criminal charge. I naively accepted the first offer presented to me by my public defender. One mistake in the life I painstakingly built brick by brick for myself and my children was smushed, was crushed to smithereens. I could talk for hours and tell you countless true stories and examples of the negative impact that corrections had had on me and my friends and family. I could tell you about the discrimination and mistreatment I've experienced at the hands of those responsible for helping me. 
I could discuss a corrections officer who publicly made fun of my hearing impairment and refused to follow orders from higher ups instructing him to accommodate me and how to do so just because he could, it was in a position of power over me. Today, however, I wanna briefly discuss the reality of prison culture and how different it is from what the general public is led to believe. And frankly, how extremely dangerous and detrimental it is to a whole group of people who are caught up in a cycle of poverty and crime because they can't see any other option to stay afloat or get ahead other than to commit crimes for survival. Our society needs alternatives to incarceration that actually address underlying problems, ultimately correcting something versus breaking our communities down. I would say easily at least 90% or more of incarcerated people at CRCF are survivors of domestic assault and or sexual assault, myself included. Um, I have mental health challenges that were undiagnosed at the time when I committed my crime. Since then, I've also been diagnosed with serious post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, largely due to my time under supervision. And I am the rule, not the exception. Over the past couple of years, at least 40 formerly incarcerated women that I became friends with for lack of any other social interactions, have overdosed and died following their horrendous experiences in prison and being separated, most of them permanently, from their children and family members. Over my 15 years, I was in and out of prison several times, for usually about a year at a time, due to minor technical, technical charging rules um, infractions that didn't have to be proven by DOC. And my lack of money, sorry, my lack of money um, was made it hard for me to get back out. I couldn't get a residence. So I was I would sit in there and lack, and lack a residence. Um, my first eight years after my initial six months inside, I received no violations at all. Then I was assigned a new probation officer. I have served about five years inside simply due to my lack of financial resources, like I said. I'm allowed to have custody of my son and allowed to reside in a BHA, Burlington Housing Authority, um, subsidized housing complex, but as a quote unquote violent offender, I am not eligible for subsidized housing or a housing voucher. Then these are priced at market rate, which is $1,300 per month, plus utility for my apartment, which I need to maintain in order to keep my three-year-old done with me. I'm a hard worker, but most places with a livable wage won't give me a chance. And in fact, most places, including most gas stations or fast food restaurants, won't allow me to work. It feels pretty hopeless, but I haven't given up and I won't because I have kids who need me and have no one else. I've given birth to two children while incarcerated. The year that I maxed out, I had my three-year-old son and my entire pregnancy behind bars due to lack of residence or the financial means to obtain a residence. I was ineligible for most programming, including sublet housing due to my status as a violent offender. The OC estimates that it costs about $100,000 per year to keep a female in inmate housed. When someone has medical issues and is at high risk, I'm sure it's quite a bit more than that. All of my pregnancies have been high risk. My youngest son is no exception. I have preeclampsia in all of them. Despite, despite being hungry, incredibly uncomfortable, and unsupported by any outside means, I did my best to keep my head up and stay positive. When I approached medical staff, I was usually shut down. Countless ail ailments went largely untreated, but I always believed in choosing a positive mindset, so I did. I worked a laundry job in the facility and I earned $3 a day. I stayed active, walking the track outside at rec. I planned as much as possible for my post-relief life with a new baby. I miraculously was granted admission to the Lund home following my release which I thought was my best chance of providing my baby with some stability, services, and support. I had a C-section on November 1st, 2019. While in the hospital, I began showing signs that physically something was wrong with me. Usually my blood pressure is fairly low and steady, but it was bouncing all over the place. With my medical history, the docs and nursing staff were becoming very concerned. However, DOC and CRCF required a CO to be at the hospital with me at all times. I remember one male officer wouldn't even leave the room while a doctor examined my lady purse. It was humiliating. The doctor even said to him, I'm sorry. Um, Charlie Hurst, please stand outside the room next to the door. She can't even walk and just had a very painful major surgery. When it came time for my discharge from UVM Medical Center, the nurses were extremely scared for me to return to the facility for fear of my health and safety. The prison, however, was short staffed as per usual and didn't like having to keep a CO with me. The hospital called CRCF medical staff and gave very clear instructions to keep my, all my medications and to check my blood pressure at least three times a day, or preferably every four hours as my blood pressure was indicative of a problem. I was really struggling being separated from my newborn. They promised the hospital they would follow these orders. Literally as soon as I returned, the medical staff chose to ignore the medical instructions. Day after day, I felt worse and worse. 
I put in sick call slips after slips and said something at every med, med, med car, um, which was like three times a day. I kept getting blown off. <laughs> there wasn't anyone available to check in with me psychologically either. And all I thought about was ending my life. My friends on the unit could see that I could barely stand up and started putting my medical slips too on my behalf. This was about two weeks after I had my son, and I had yet to have a blood pressure taken, which is a simple, non-invasive, quick thing that you can do in 10 seconds. <laughs> finally, my friend actually corrected something and made a, or finally, sorry, I think my, I got a little typo in here, but um, finally, one of my friends actually contacted somebody on the outside of the ACLU. <laughs> Luckily, she was able to convince uh, medical staff to come check the blood pressure. <laughs> Thank God. Um, so... What happened was I ended up getting my blood pressure checked and it was so bad that they wouldn't even let me walk back to my unit. Um, they called an ambulance. I got, you know, they took me off the table. I got in the ambulance um, and I started having um, seizures and stuff. They thought I was gonna have a stroke, an unconscious, just on the way to the hospital. Um, I had postpartum eclampsia, which is really serious. Um, and after, they should have, you know, been looking because I had already had the history of preeclampsia so much. Um, so that was really scary. They didn't even, they like didn't even say anything about it. Like they didn't say we're sorry, we didn't check your blood pressure, <laughs> anything like that. They just, you know what I mean? So I ended up having to go to the hospital. I stayed there for about two weeks with the, the eclampsia. Yeah, really serious. Um, almost died. Well, thank God, like I said, my friend was able to get someone to call. Um, so like I said, I apologize. This is a little typo going on here, but I'll just finish this up. Basically, what I want to say is that, um, you know, you can do something and it can make a huge difference to someone. Like, instead of spending $270 million or $70 million or whatever, you know, you, it, it's estimated is a little bit different. Like, it's been estimated a couple of times. But instead of spending all that money on a prison, you could actually, like, get these women a house and a car <laughs> and still have money left over. I mean, I know that's not something that they would do, but the point is you could do something to really help these people instead of taking away like their families and their homes and then having to have them start over completely every time they get out in the community. And instead of being judged and feeling like discriminated against every time they go somewhere or looked down upon, um, you know, maybe they wouldn't lose those connections that they had and maybe they would, you know, feel like they had some hope and could actually participate in community. So I just want to urge everyone to just think about definitely the possibility of alternatives to, um, to prison and incarceration because it really isn't helpful like people think it is. It does a lot of harm, a lot of harm. So thank you. Thank you. I know. I know what you shared with us is very personal. Yeah, and you've done it in a public way, and I know that's very, very difficult to do. Thank you. I'm sorry. It was a little. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. So we may have a question or two. Okay. Go ahead. And just would echo the chair there, Tiffany. Thanks so much. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah. Something came up. I think I was unaware as a uh, you know violent offender that you would be ineligible for housing vouchers. Is, is that is that indefinitely or for a period of time? It depends on the like what it is, but I'm um I'm on a registry, so I can't get housing ever. Yeah. Okay. So yep. yeah. It seems strange that somebody would be eligible for the state to take care of their children, children right. but maybe not be eligible for the resources to do that. So that, right, yeah. and I felt like that was very odd. Um, I do feel like it's a huge contradiction, and that's why I actually included that information because I think it's. I think it says a lot that, you know, I mean, I had um, evaluations done and I actually was proven to be not a risk to anybody, but they still classified me this way. Um, and so I am I was allowed to have raised my kid by myself, single mom, all boys. Um, and I'm allowed to live in a housing authority complex, a family complex, you know, families everywhere, but I'm just not allowed to have the financial help. I wonder if some of that is federal. It's, it's very, yeah. I think it is, yeah, I think it's HUD. Uh, any assault conviction disqualifies yeah. sex. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Yeah. That's federal. Across the board. Across the board, yeah. So it's crazy the way it's intuitive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But anyway. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you. Can we have another question. Okay. I know we don't have much time. So 
But I just wanted to take a minute and thank you for your testimony. It means a lot to us. And um, okay, I think of one question I'd, I would love to ask you is just how do you have hope? How do I what? How do you have hope? You said you have a positive mental attitude. And, like, you get a I honestly of- don't know. <laughs> um, I think a large part of it really has to do with my kids, you know, and um, just like the fact that I love them so much and I just being to be around them gives me hope. You know what I mean? I just, that's why I think it's so hard for the moms that aren't around their kids. Um, I think that makes it just so much worse. Uh, I wasn't around my kids for a little bit and it was like devastating. But I do think that I'm someone that just, I constantly kind of keep getting up and keep going. And that's kind of like just my personality, I guess. Um, But, you know, it's harder, like, I'm not always hopeful. <laughs> it's definitely harder than. Um, I would understand if you weren't, but, but seeing you yeah. indicate that you are, you have a positive attitude, and I try to learn from from that. I, thank you. So thank you for sharing. <laughs> thank you, Tiffany. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't know who's going next. So Sorry, right. folks. I have an extended testimony I'll hand out after, but and if you could just identify yourself for the record. Yeah. So my name is Jada Asal, and I am the three-year campaign organizer for the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. Um, so I'll just jump into it. I'm also a native Vermonter and graduate of the University of Vermont. And the National Council is the only national advocacy organization founded and led by incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women. And their organizing began in the federal prison yard in Danbury, Connecticut, when a group of women decided to insist that policymakers instituting criminal justice reform hear the voices of formerly incarcerated people, those who understand the harm the current system inflicts and have the expertise to create an alternative system that recognizes each person's humanity. Our staff and members have lived in some of the oldest and most decrepit state and federal prisons in this country and newer remodeled prisons. The concept of a trauma-informed prison has been rejected by formerly incarcerated women and experts alike. There's evidence that prison-based treatment is, there's no evidence that prison-based treatment is effective for women, and there's no such thing as a safe prison for women at all. We all agree that CRCF is unlivable, and today I would like to make the case for why we should pause prison construction and focus on decarceration and alternatives in the hopes that you will be receptive to slowing down the process. So on April 11th, 2023, 106 women were incarcerated at CRCF, and of those, less than half have been sentenced. The rest are being held pre-trial or on some sort of detainer. When you consider that some of these women are also incarcerated for technical parole violations, something as trivial as missing an appointment and others can't make bail, when taking those women into account, as well as those who are suffering from mental illness and should be in treatment, it is hard to see who is left. In fact, we estimate that around 20 women currently are considered high risk, and we think that they can be housed in a facility that does not have to look like or cost as much as a prison. Investing in supportive housing structures is also a much quicker solution than building a large prison, and would also address other urgent needs we have as a community. It is important that these conversations not be siloed and consider the broader landscape of needed services in Vermont. When you realize that we may only require a facility for a small number of women, overall homelessness in Vermont rates second worst in the country per capita, and that there will soon be 1,500 more unhoused Vermonters after the termination of our emergency hotel housing program, why would we look at this moment and decide prisons are what we need? The state wants to spend at least $70 million on top of operating costs to double the state's capacity to incarcerate women, And between March 2020 and December 2022, Vermont paid hotels $166 million to house people experiencing homelessness, according to data provided by DCF. Why is it that we have millions of dollars for temporary solutions like hotels and prisons, but not for long-term solutions like permanent housing, which is foundational to healing, recovery, and preventing further harm? Members of this committee were surprised when women who are currently incarcerated advised against building a new prison and asked that the money be put into community programs, housing and training to break the cycle of recidivism. I can assure you that these voices are not anomalies and women want to get home and more importantly, stay there. 
This is not possible without the kind of wraparound services that the committee heard about on Tuesday, including assistance, finding employment, counseling, and care for those struggling with substance use disorder. We also heard testimony from women that while the building might change, the culture of incarceration, which is so harmful, would not. They want a different focus and something that gives them hope. Although building a new prison is the knee-jerk response, it is not the only option and certainly not the quickest. And prisons do not allow us to address the underlying social problems that are leading people to incarceration. It is a haphazard solution and Vermonters should not need to go to prison and end up with charges to receive MAT or other recovery services. It is yet a reflection of how we choose to invest in incarceration and not care. And how do we know that the services, opinions, and perspectives of all these service provider organizations are not affected by the influence of getting so much funding from DOC? What could be possible for these groups if there were no stipulations around their funding and services? These are some of the many reasons we need to take prison construction off the table to clear our minds to picture what different looks like. In addition, there's legislation moving through the General Assembly that will impact discussions around a replacement for CRCF as well. There are just so many elements to this decision that we must be thoughtfully considering when spending this much money. We should not be afraid of decarceration. The Department of Corrections has no problem finding women to send home to ease overcrowding. And here in Vermont and throughout the country, people were sent home to, spread, to stop the spread of COVID in carceral settings. This did not cause a public safety crisis, and study after study has shown that people age out of committing transgressions. Yet 15 women currently in CRCF are over 50 years old. There's so much decarceration work we can start in that would greatly affect the number of people cycling through our state carceral system. We can utilize primary caretaker legislation, medical parole, furlough, and other viable release mechanisms, including placing people in the community to serve the remainder of their sentence on supervision. By taking prison construction off the table for five years, we'll finally have the opportunity to create alternative solutions that solve problems preemptively. We already have a plethora of options to start building with. There are empty dorms across the state that we could transform into supported housing, peer respites, micro community models, and other reentry and supportive programming across the country to replicate. Vermont has managed the last 16 years without building any new prisons. It certainly can handle five years without new construction. We are asking you to consider the bills H445 and H438 and our proposed amendment to the working group language. And we are open to coming back to review the amendment together if you're willing to have us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Could, could you expand on micro community? <clears throat> so this is a concept I've talked about a bit with Brett Sheena. Um, I think it might be better. Micro you, residential. Yeah, micro residential, residential. So they're basically smaller communities that have those wraparound services more conveniently located so people don't have to be traveling to receive those things outside of the places they live in. Okay. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Tristan? Just... In the interest of time and when we hear from everyone, I'll try to keep this concise and focused, but um, just to understand better your testimony and relative to other testimony we're hearing, you, know, you, you, know, you mentioned uh, technical violations being a reason why women are incarcerated. Um, and we've heard from VOC on this, and we've heard from the parole board on this. They work, that testimony is that they work really hard not to reincarcerate for trivial matters that um, it really has to escalate and become more serious matter. Do you have any commentary on that, whether quantitative or qualitative? I've been hearing specifically there are issues with the furlough program structure and that folks are set up basically to fail, like there will be intensive curfew, so they'll have to be home for 12 hours, yet they still need to attend doctor's appointments, get groceries, run other errands just to survive. So I think the technical violations specifically that are embedded in the furlough program are causing folks to be sent to prison again. So has your organization reached out to corrections itself, to the Department of Corrections, to the commissioner's office for some of these concerns? No, but I did watch the testimony yesterday and I appreciated that they did extend an invitation to us. 
but I would like just to say that even though this has been open and ongoing, um, I think it's really important how we do outreach for these kind of things, because even though there was an open invitation, I had no idea about the working group until my organization and community experts helped me get to the space where I would even be able to know about something like this. And I know other folks in the community that are directly impacted or formerly incarcerated, they don't know about this working group either. So I would just like to bring up that sometimes access to information and certain relationships makes it easier for people to have a foot in the door. So I'm, I'm sort of thinking in terms of some of the issues you just put on the table that it's really not the working group that would be working on those issues. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking that it might be more advantageous to ask directly to sit down with the commissioner of corrections and have that face-to-face -face engagement. It might be a little better avenue than going through a working group that really isn't geared to address some of the concerns you folks have been putting, you've been putting on the table. But this, what you've been putting on the table is quite a bit different mm -hmm. than this. Um, and it goes into a lot more of the systems within the Department of Corrections. Mm -hmm. It's not just limited to the women's facility, but across the board. So it might be better to go directly to the Commissioner of Corrections and sit down and have a conversation. That could be a step, but I also just reflecting from conversations from yesterday, the commissioner was saying how if the General Assembly does want to go in a direction of alternatives, that would be something you all have to decide and tell them. Essentially, they're like contractors of the state, so they have to do what we tell them. So I think it would be good to have some kind of formal structure to ensure we're on a path to alternatives, if that makes sense. It's a two-way street. Yes. I just want to put that out. Yeah. It's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. And it would be very helpful for corrections to hear some, particularly when we're talking about violations of technical violations mm -hmm. of furlough, because corrections sets that. It's mm -hmm. not the legislative branch okay. that sets that. It's corrections that sets that. And it's corrections staff that oversee folks who are out in the community on furlough. The legislature doesn't get involved at that level, okay. and neither would a working group. That would be directly related to corrections and the management of corrections through the commissioner. Mm -hmm. So for something like that, that's really more the avenue for that. Because those conditions of furlough, furlough is under the direction of corrections, and those conditions are set by corrections. That's not set by the legislative branch. Okay. So there is some separation there. Mm -hmm. Try. Um, I'm going to start with a little context, um, and, and this is even before, so before I was elected, um, I, I was running unopposed, so I kind of quickly started trying to get up to speed with what might be on my plate, and um, the person who held my seat before me is a dear friend and incredibly committed to your work, um, so I knew this was important to her, um, and I do have many constituents who, right, I, I've got district specific stuff, mostly around the university and its impact on housing. And then I've got bigger items. And I have plenty of constituents who align with your mission and their faces are in my, I see their faces now as I talk to you. Um, and I'm realizing since I've been in the job, um, the, the potential here for disappointment. And, and I wanna take a moment to talk about being disappointed and being the disappointment. Um, um, I'm learning that um, as I watch, right? So, and, and we kind of hopped on a train when we showed up in January that had already been moving. And the women's prison facility is most certainly on that train and has momentum and before I got here, I, right, I, 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 I'm so appreciative of your voice and the work you're doing and the opportunities you have provided me to learn about this even before I got here in January. Um, so thank you. Um, and as I, I kind of hopped on that train, um, right, I'm, I'm one person in a committee of 11 and I'm slowly learning um, kind of 
what keeps moving, right? And where the brakes are, if they are there. And I'm just recognizing this as a high potential for disappointment. And I, I want you to know that I see that. Um, and I want you to know that I'm part of that disappointment. I know that. Um, and and I, I, I guess I want everyone to know uh, who's providing testimony today that um, I, I'm willing to hear about that even after today. So please keep those avenues open. Um, but I do think the potential for disappointment, right? These are big, big bills um, and I align with them and my constitu constituents align with them. I know that, I know there are hopes and expectations on me um, from people who live in Chittenden 15 that I respect and care about. And um, I'm glad I'm serving. Um, so I know I'm gonna have to talk to them about those disappointments as well should they arrive, arise. Um, but I know the potential for disappointment here is big, bigger than um, kind of other bills I've been involved with or advocated for. All that being said, so one, please, I, I'm, I'm willing to hear that disappointment. I'm willing to be that disappointment. I, I, and I wanna continue that conversation um, if it shows up. Um, Given that potential, do you like when you look at what's in 438 and when you look at what's in 445, um, as we start playing the game of what can we get out of this? What can we keep? What can we hold on to and slap onto S14 or other things? Are there priorities, mm -hmm. right? Like this is this is what we want, this, right? And I, I'll leave it there. Like, like, is there a ranking here? Is there anything that you want to really, really punctuate for us? Yeah, I appreciate that. And I just want to say that we do not want to be a thorn in anyone's side. Like, we you just want to make sure that we are expressing the voices of folks that are marginalized. And um, I would say what would be most priority is just including and keeping in discussions the option for supported housing. I think we've heard testimony all week from people that housing is foundational. So even if the state does decide on a prison, I feel like there has to be some kind of supported housing facility integrated into that plan. So I would say just broadening the site selection would be our number one ask right now. And just keeping eyes open for more appropriate treatment for people that is not a prison. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And you get to be a thorn in our side. That, that is precisely your role. And I have tried, and my committee, I think, well, our job is to listen to you, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and you belong in that process. And anger belongs. And th there's a lot to be angry about here, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really well aware of how we gatekeep that anger and where it's coming from, right? Mm -hmm. So somebody like me, who has been socialized to express that anger and right it, it, it's, it's different so I, I i just want to you get to be a thorn in our side and you get to be angry and you get to be disappointed we have to listen to that so thank you thank you for coming forward thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you. so next <laughs> next <laughs> Speak the thorns and sides. <laughs> I think I'll fill in the blanks between the bridge of what this is all about and be a bit of a conscience here and continue to talk about the humanity of the women involved. My name is Ope Emi Parham no, and I, I am a retired physician and I worked in the prison system in the carceral system. So I don't have the prepared notes, but I have an outline and Brian has a copy of what I am about to say. I sit here at this committee as a concerned citizen with lived experience of our carceral system here in America. I did my own stint of service as a medical director at the Massachusetts State Prison for Women in the late 1990s. I expected to serve three to five years myself, the same amount of time that many of the women were getting as mandatory drug sentences. So I'm gonna be speaking to the business side of all of this because I know you have a lot of lobbying at you from two agencies, particularly Core Civic, and oh, there's the new guy in town, that's WellPath. So I hope you all know who all of those people are. I only lasted two years. During that time, I saw nothing rehabilitative happening to those women. There was one program, Girl Scouts Beyond Bars, 
that connected the mamas with their nine to 11 year old daughters once a month for a Girl Scout troop meeting within the prison walls. The other three weeks out of the month, the daughters met with their social leader and the scout leader outside of in the community. Um, you have heard testimony of what it's like to be a mother. I would tell you in my medical ward, it really was only one phone call. And those women would not call their lawyers. They would call their children to make sure their children were all checked in with and to make sure they knew what was gonna happen with their kids. And they were standing in line at pay phones back then. I saw from inside the belly of the beast, a corporate management system that did not have the best interests of the incarcerated individuals at heart. Apparently, corruption and greed in the prison industrial complex has only grown in the last 20 years. Vermont currently utilizes Core Civic to manage its prison system and has just announced a new three-year contract with WellPath to manage medical care within that prison system. I easily Googled Core Civic controversy and WellPath controversy. I got an entire page of various concerns in prisons around the nation, from maggots being found in food served to inmates, through inmate deaths due to insufficient medical care. I can testify on that. I saved two lives, two lives by being in the right place at the right time within a system, to the illegal firing of whistleblowers. I suggest to this committee that the last thing Vermont needs at this moment in our growth is another prison for women. I understand that there might be a great deal of disappointment here. I understand the wheels are rolling. You understand that I intend to tell every Vermonter I know how much we are spending every year to incarcerate an individual, $113,000 per year. In my time, it was $35,000 a year. And that happened to be the same price you would pay for one year of tuition at Harvard. And I was in Boston and I could not stand the thought. That's what my country was doing with its money. In the 1990s, no, 1950s, there was a movie that was entirely through the white gaze, but it was all about Spitfire Grill. It was about redemption for a woman who'd been incarcerated in a small town in Maine. You can find it, you can watch it, please watch it. If you're on this committee, can you at least watch one movie, Spitfire Grill, all right? I'm not gonna do any spoilers on that one. You had a movie right down the street about two people who beat the system over 20 years. It was called 1001. It was about black people, so it's not so relevant to here because face it, you're in a system. If our little state is uniquely positioned to explore alternatives to incarceration, where I was, 600 women were at my facility every year. These women's primary problem for me was that they had been connected with the wrong people. Relationships were wrong. Their upbringing was terrible in that they didn't have a lot of parenting. People who often introduced them to drugs and got them hooked were the people that they loved, all right? And in the 1950s, the movie Caged looked at all of this. And at the end of the movie, the woman is looking at the woman who came in innocent and leaves a hardened criminal and says, oh, she'll be back. So I wanna suggest that recidivism is a part of our system right now. And it's a bad part of our system because I realized that these inmates were not who I was serving. I was serving a business. In Massachusetts, it was called Correctional Medical Services and it was a division of Aeromark. And Aeromark is a hot dog vendor that has gone all the way up to prison industrial complex. You know, how wonderful. I was getting six figures and my colleagues were not able to speak English well or easily and had been trained outside the United States and were having trouble getting jobs here in the United States. You need to look at who is staffing these places. And the two agencies right here in Little Old Vermont don't have such great reputations. So if we're spending $113,000 a year, how can my legislators expect the average Vermonter to believe that this is a good investment and we're still arguing over free lunches for kids and over a school moratorium. I believe that chronic recidivism is a part of all of this. And I expect you all to pay attention to all the stakeholders you've heard today. And I know you don't hear as much from us as you hear from 
the guys at MMR down the street with the suits. And I know there's women on the staff too. I, I know who they are. I beg you to look at these numbers and know that we only have, as you've heard, less than 100 women who are going to be affected by all of this. So yes, there's a steamroller going ahead. And we're going to go ahead and send good money after that. But I'm telling you right now, Cassandra, though it may be, this is good money going after bad. And I am calling my legislators to account for the fact that maybe you didn't know how bad it is, but it's really bad. And this is your committee. And you're going to have to stay awake to all of this because it's kind of painful and it's kind of harsh and it's kind of real. So that's what I'd like to share. And I'm open to questions. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Doctor. Mm -hmm. Are there questions? A sobering presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Brian disappeared. You gonna go find them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Parham. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about um, it's been framed as right there? I think um, I was asking um, the director of the medical. Max. Never mind. Never mind. They were doing a test. This is a test. Evacuation, gather your belongings if they are within reach, and evacuate the building and using the designated route for your area with the closest stairwell or exit. Assemble in for a designated area and check in with your fire and life and safety. You don't think it's the test? The test was the roll call. Yeah, the yeah, test was the roll call. The numbers were way over our. We gotta go down to the pavilion. We go through the fire escape. Yeah, we all sat very close. Fire escape. Yeah, no, we're still in the fire. Can I help you on that? Let me get my hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 You want somebody to go with you? No, no. Yeah. 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 Mary goes down the elevator. Yeah. Somebody open the elevator. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
attention, please. This is a building evacuation. Gather your belongings if they are within reach and evacuate the building and using the designated route for your area with the closest stairwell or exit. Assemble in through a designated area and check in with your fire and life and safety for more.
Well, Tristan and I just walked yeah, by the cafeteria for that bag. I almost yeah. turned around and went to yeah. the back door. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Get out any way you can. Yeah. Yeah. The, and just seal the doors to make sure that they're not warm. So just so let folks know, we're still on YouTube. Say hi to John, he's watching. Did you hear at all what happened? Well, what I heard was it might be a faulty, and they're doing all the testing. We didn't expect this to happen, so it's not going to be a faulty. One of them said something about how, you know, we 